like magic. We're Just back. Like We're right back. <laughs> How's it going, you two? Uh, please, please, we'll start. Uh, let's start with Ryan, uh, and we'll do some quick intros. Tell us who you are and uh, what you do here. Sure. Uh, I'm Ryan Malecki. I'm the solution architect for AWS Cleanrooms, based out of New York. All right. Hey, I'm um, Ankur Agarwal. I'm a product manager on AWS Clean Rooms, also based out of New York. Great to Welcome be here. Welcome to the show, both of you, yeah. both of you. Uh, now, it's very interesting. I'm, I'm going to throw out what uh, I most associate with Clean Rooms. So uh, growing up, my, my dad worked at uh, Texas Instruments, right? And so they create chips, right? And when you are fabricating chip, like, like mm -hmm. computer chips, you have a clean room, uh, but that's not what this is. This has nothing to do with fabrication of uh, silicon chips. Instead, uh, Ankur, Ryan, which, whoever wants to take this, what is AWS clean room? Yeah, sure. I think it's uh, it's a little different and I'd a love little. to talk about it. And, uh, and essentially just like everything we do at Amazon, we were talking to a lot of customers and a lot of customers shared how difficult it was for them to have data collaborations with partners outside of their company and sometimes even internally. And uh, especially the regulatory landscape around user privacy was becoming more stringent and it was leading to more decentralized data sets. People had different types of data in different places and a lot of collective analysis was needed for uh, sort of decision making, but there weren't really great tools available. So uh, a lot of the value was being uh, left on the table. So we heard from a lot of customers and essentially there were three things that they wanted. A lot of our customers already stored their data in AWS and they wanted to collaborate without creating copies of their data. Secondly, they wanted something, uh, a solution uh, for data collaboration that could be easily integrated into their existing applications and solutions and, and sometimes could be offered as a white label offering. And finally, most importantly, they had a very high bar on privacy. And so we knew that we needed to meet that with a broad set of privacy controls. So now I'll answer your question on what is AWS Clean Rooms. AWS Clean Rooms is a new AWS analytics service. It was pre-announced at reInvent and it was launched in preview yesterday. So we are very oh, fresh from a launch day. Thank you. And it helps customers collaborate with their partners uh, to more easily and securely analyze their collective data sets without actually sharing or revealing underlying, underlying raw data. My colleague Ryan will show you how customers can create secure data clean rooms in minutes, use a broad set of privacy controls, and start collaborating with their data partners to get unique insights from collective data. So I know we're probably going to come back and talk a little bit about the, the, the privacy piece later on, but can you elaborate a little bit more on the kind of data sets that we're talking about here that people are trying to collectively analyze? Yeah, absolutely. So we're seeing a lot of interest from financial services, healthcare, advertising, and marketing industry. Uh, but one of the industries where we're seeing a lot of early adoption is indeed advertising and marketing. Advertisers are looking at creating more efficient and personalized experiences using data that is owned by different partners, such as in some cases, media publishers or third party measurement companies. And given the challenging regulatory landscape, data clean rooms are unlocking a lot of interesting use cases in this industry. So as some examples, like we're seeing a lot of customers using AWS clean rooms to better plan their ad campaigns. Before running an ad campaign, advertisers can find where their customers are. For instance, advertisers have their loyalty consumer data mm -hmm. and they want to know which of the publishing platforms would they find most of their uh, active and loyal customers so that they can really communicate with their loyal customers uh, or loyalty customers uh, based on where they are. Advertisers are also generating um, unique audience segments for activations or suppression based on insights extracted from collective data. I personally see a lot of ads for a product even after I've made a purchase. And now I know why that is. And it's because in most cases, the data about sales and ads impressions is owned by different companies. And there aren't really great ways for them to collaborate and extract these, these collective insights securely. Mm -hmm. um, and especially because it contains user data. And using clean, clean rooms, advertisers and publishers can collaborate securely to suppress ads for users that have already made a purchase. And that really helps with uh, making the, the ad, ad, ad campaigns more effective. Um, and post campaign, Ryan is gonna show you how um, customers can use AWS clean rooms for campaign attribution and mes measurement. For instance, advertisers have their first party sales data and they can match that with ad impressions data from media publishers to understand attribution and lift how many people 
bought a product after seeing an ad in the last 30 days, for instance. And again, uh, doing it securely with a broad set of privacy controls, I think that is the key here without actually, you know, the user data moving um, at all. Yeah, I mean, that that's a massive problem uh, mm -hmm. across the board with with not even just this, but lots and lots of use cases around data is, is that uh, there's, there's a level of convenience that you need to be able to share data, but that often is in direct conflict with your security and privacy measures, right? Uh, and that's the, the name of the game for security in general, right? Convenience versus uh, security is something we hear all the time. What does what does Clean Room specifically do to help you monitor who's accessing the data? You know who who has access to the data. You know, are we talking um, you know ACLs here? Are we talking audit logs? What, what are the what are the types of features that I could expect when I moved it into a Clean Room? Yeah, great question, and that's where we spent a lot of time uh, building sort of fine grained access controls. Um, so, so we have things like query restrictions. So data owners, when they associate their data within a clean room, um, they can configure column level controls. They can specify mm -hmm. that this particular column can be, you know, only a certain function can be used on this column. Oh, interesting. You need to join the data before being able to query it with another table using a, a join column that you can specify. So there's a lot of things that you can do. Uh, which Ryan is going to demonstrate that uh, that gives you the peace of mind that no one's really running like a select star from my table. In many cases, there are query um, there are query structures you can pick like only aggregate functions that um, that, uh, that that will ensure that you never output raw row, row level data. So there's a lot of fine grained controls that you can you can configure on the data before even associating it within a clean room. And you know you're talking about encryption earlier. Uh, yeah. We have cryptographic computing functionality that enables you to pre-encrypt your data before even associating it with an AWS Clean Rooms collaboration so that queries are actually executed on encrypted data. Uh, mm -hmm. We also have things like minimum aggregation thresholds to further mitigate the risk that information about a small group of individuals is released through the analysis. Um, and finally, as you mentioned, uh, as sort of the proactive mechanisms to ensure that, uh, that you have full visibility each data owner in a collaboration can also enable query logs to receive detailed information, including query text on the queries that were executed on the data. So there's a lot of proactive and reactive mechanisms to ensure that you first set the clean, set data access controls in a way that, and that you're most comfortable with and that uh, you can monitor it you know, to ensure that it is used in a way that, uh, that you intended it. So not only locking down what you can do to in a sense, but also who did it right or who tried to do it right. okay. uh, we, we had a question from chat earlier around the cryptographic computing uh, side uh, specifically they're asking about aes 256 um but uh, what what encryption options are there on the on the in, encrypted computing side yeah ryan do you want to take it? sorry go ahead ryan sure sure so it's worth uh breaking up uh to two halves to this question. One mm -hmm. is AWS Cleanrooms is operating on data in customers' data lakes uh, right. stored in S3. So all of the tools that customers are used to using to do server-side encryption in S3 can continue to work as, as normal. We're also launching a, a new client-side tool, uh, C3R we call it, uh, Cryptographic Computing for Cleanrooms that allows customers to uh, coordinate on how all of the members in a cleaner will, will encrypt their data using a variety of different uh, encryption methods to, uh, to achieve different outcomes. So encrypting specific columns that they wanna join on in one way and other columns that they wanna be able to decrypt later on in another way. So definitely, we'd encourage customers who are interested in learning more to check out the C3R GitHub repo in our documentation. So that, like, the first option just uh, uh, goes against whatever, it uses whatever encryption is, is in the underlying data storage. Uh, so yep. you have options there through things like KMS, et cetera. Yep. Right. yep. Customers who are used to working with data in, in a data lake uh, with a service like Athena or Redshift Spectrum. Yeah. Uh, 
uh, AWS Clean Rooms is is consuming those same data sets and will work with the data they already have in place. I love it. I wanted to ask about the uh, the individual column level restraints that you can put in there too. I imagine too, it, it sounds like Clean Rooms gives you a lot of capabilities then that you can utilize in interesting ways. Uh, one of the ways that popped in my head was uh, that's probably how you would implement something like anonymizing data, right? Uh, if you know which columns control or, or contain personally identifiable information, you can make rules then that, that don't show that those columns in the case of certain users accessing that data. Is that something that yeah. we, we take a, yeah, we take a, a there's a slight nuance there. Uh, a lot of times when you're trying to tie together, understand the, the journey a user is taking, you actually need to leverage those columns that try, tie back to uh, individual users to join together data sets. So rather than blocking access to those columns, we actually uh, allow a data owner to, to dictate how those columns can be used within queries. So I could have an identifier for a user and I can say, it's okay to join on this column, but it's not okay to select the column. So you can still accomplish your goal, oh, okay. run those analytics, but not mm -hmm. expose that underlying sensitive data. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, and oftentimes you'll have like an anonymized uh, user ID, right? That mm -hmm. that just joins a, against that, mm -hmm. user, but but it never tells you that user's email address or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and and you can go even further than that. Uh, we have a feature called output constraints oh. that lets customers uh, dictate what level of granularity results will be returned. So even if someone tried to write a query that returned information about only a single person, the output constraints would prevent that data from being exposed. Yeah. That's super cool. Yeah. Um, so Ryan, uh, uh, Encore mentioned a demo a yeah. number of times. Yeah. What do you think? Sure. We we like uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can get started and I can do a uh, highlight of the service. So I'm gonna take a minute here and quickly talk through the workflow. As I mentioned before, we're starting with data sets that are in a customer's data lake in S3 cataloged in Glue, and also the partners that a customer wants to collaborate with. We have two top level resources in uh, clean rooms. The first is a collaboration. This is keeping track of who's involved in an analysis. So only the data sets that the uh, accounts will be accessible. Uh, in cleaner. The other is configure tables. This is mapping the rules for how data can be used to specific tables in a customer's data lake. We associate the tables to a collaboration and each member of the collaboration will go through the same process. And at this point, the data is ready to be queried. So I'm going to talk through a demo here where on one hand, uh, on the red account I'll be showing, a marketer at an airline wants to measure the impact of a campaign they're running in a social media platform. The airline has ticket sales data, conversion data, and the social media platform has impression data, who saw which ads went. So I'll hop into my AWS environment. This red count account is the airline, and this blue account is the social media company. I actually already created the collaboration resource to save a bit of time. Uh, so the airline invited the social media company to join a collaboration. Here I can see that invitation. I can review what AWS accounts are involved, uh, as well as whether logging is supported, whether the cryptographic computing features are enabled. I'm happy with these settings, so I'm going to create a membership that links my account to this collaboration and turn on logging. A customer can leave and remove access to their data at any point by deleting that membership resource. Now that I've created the collaboration, I'm going to create a configured table that uh, applies controls to that impressions data. So I'll create a new configured table resource. I'm going to select from uh, databases and tables that are already available in my Glue data catalog. I can select which columns I wanna make available so here I'm selecting campaign ID, creative ID, that identifier that is a shared 
uh, ID between the airline and the social media company, as well as the date. Uh, and from here, I'll create the configure table resource. Next, I'm creating an analysis rule. This is the rule that dictate how the data can be used in a query. Uh, we support a few different types. I can select what kind of aggregation functions I want to allow on a column by column basis. So here I want to be able to count the number of unique identifiers, the number of unique users, and the total number of users. We also support sum and average. I can specify how this data set can be joined to other data sets, including what, uh, what the join key will be. Again, I'll select that identifier. We support the ability to control which columns can be used to slice and dice the data in things like where clauses and group buys, as well as a range of functions that can be used to manipulate the data within the query. Then I'm going to set the uh, aggregation constraint. This is the setting I mentioned earlier that limits the granularity of the results. So here I wanna say if a particular row in the results refers to less than 100 users, don't return that row to minimize the risk of leaking data about individuals. Mm -hmm. And with that, I've configured my rules. These rules are applied on each table that'll be joined to the collaboration. And then the effective rules on queries are the, the sum of the rules on every table. So with this, I'm going to associate this table. Right, I don't wanna break your flow. I'm sorry, I just was curious. Are there any uh, kind of general recommendations that you can give when building those? Like what are some of the common, uh, like you just gave one, right? The, yep. If, if it's uh, less than a hundred people that, that likely indicate yeah. that somebody might be leaking data or might be able to yeah. associate data because there's not enough records, things like that. Any others? Sure. So the controls are really going to depend on the, cus the customer's right. use case. If I'm sharing data with a sister uh, a sister entity within my organization and we're, we're all following the same, uh, the same policies, the same rules, I might say 10 is the right constraint there. And mm -hmm. I'm okay including all of the columns in my data set as columns that can be used within the clean room. If I'm working with a third party that we just have a very specific business use case, I'm going to want to write a much more restrictive mm -hmm. uh, uh, analysis rule that just allows that specific use case. So uh, for configuring these controls, it's really best to start with the use case yeah. and work backwards from there. Right. So now I'm associating the table to the collaboration. One of the key things we're doing here is passing an IAM role that AWS Cleanrooms uses to access data in the customer's account. By default, our service doesn't have access to resources in customers' accounts. It's the permission customers give us. Customers can also monitor, modify, and revoke these permissions at any time. So That's I'll uh, associate the table here. <laughs> Classic. I can see fun. you've done these demos before. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, lots and lots of times. Um, now that I've associated this table, I can go back into the airline account. And I see I have this here. Mm -hmm. Should be able to I'm up. It's like it's being a bit slow at the moment. Um, so one thing I'm going to specify is the location in S3 where the results are sent. Uh, in, in the UI, it looks like I'm querying interactively, but under the hood, only able to, uh, it's waiting for, it's sending the results to S3. So now that I have this in place, I can start writing queries. Uh, so say I want to have the schema of the table, the conversions table here. So, uh, select, uh, let's select the identifier uh, from conversion. And if I try to run this query, I get an error. Oh, this yeah. is saying the identifier column 
isn't allowed in the uh, select column. And if you think about it, that's that's what I want. Um, right. I, I want clean rooms to prevent this data from being accessed. Right. But I can go in and say, do a count of that column and run this query again. And I can see that the uh, I've run into another uh, issue. Um, the live demo gods are not smiling on me today. <laughs> Brian, what, uh, what happens if you do something like select star? Um, will that also fail or will it? Yep, select star will oh, really? also fail okay. at this point. So I can run that and we'll see right. star star isn't supported at all with oh users. interesting um okay. makes sense right because um, you don't know it's going to pull all, all columns right you can't you got control yep. on those so you can't do that yeah yep so you can go through and uh jumping into my backup uh collaboration here mm -hmm. you can see you can start writing more you can joining data sets uh you can start writing more complex sql here I'm doing account distinct instead of account and adding a where clause. All of this allows me to write, uh, have the flexibility to ask the questions I want as long as those queries fit within the constraints of the analysis rules that each party sets. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the, the quick overview of AWS Cleanrooms. Uh, any questions we can answer? Did we see the uh, output constraints in the demo? I don't know if we... Uh, the output constraints are a little hard to see. Okay. Uh, basically, what, what you see with an output constraint is you don't see rows. So um, potentially, you could infer if we told you with, when rows were being filtered out, that's actually disclosing information. Yeah. So to, to make sure that we're being as, uh, as thoughtful in preserving customer privacy as possible, we uh, silently filter those out. That makes sense. Yeah, I think a good example of that would be if you wanted to group your data by US states, and let's say some of the less popular states like say North Dakota would have fewer than 100 users in that group by clause, and that row would just not show up. Uh, and some of, the, some of our customers actually have um, regulatory requirements to not you know, identify those like in the TV industry. So that is, and, and that just, that row is just, hidden from the output and uh, and that is done automatically without um, sort of letting the user know that it's being hidden. Right. Of course, unless I'm mistaken as well, the, the, the fact that you, you were writing the results to S3, as Jeff just announced, all new S3 objects are encrypted by default anyway, right? So mm -hmm. that's right. Oh yeah. Nice. Now, uh, you know, not, not to put you both on the spot, uh, but that's what we often like to do here at AWS mm -hmm. on air. It's kind of our thing. Uh, obviously this is probably not for everyone, right? Not everyone needs a clean room. Um, how do I identify the types of problems that you all are, are talking about here for myself when I'm looking to get started with AWS clean rooms? How do I know when I need a clean room? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think, uh, some of it is, um, some of the feedback that we hear from customers is around uh, needing to optimize their ad campaigns, for instance, and they're unable to do so. And when they start thinking why um, they're not able to suppress uh, some of the users that have already bought a product or they're not able to, uh, uh, to measure attribution and it's because they just don't have the data. So at any time that you feel that you're restricted by the data and you could get more insights if you had collective data outside of your organization or even within different departments, I think it's a great time to think about clean rooms. We also hear a lot of um, other use cases around healthcare and, and financial services where, for instance, different hedge funds want, want to understand how many uh, funds hold a certain position without actually sharing their individual positions with one another. Uh, and I think that those are the kind of things that, that we are hearing about from customers. So it really comes down to identifying a problem and then, and, and then identifying that there is some data out there uh, with which you can really uh, make better business decisions. And that's, that's the journey that we see our customers take. Uh, so basically, when I, I can't do this because I don't have the data, but you do. Yes. I'm going to invite you to collaborate with me and we can control what 
what is shared, what's seen, and what comes out in the output. It sounds like in a nutshell, right? You need like two minimum things: uh, a reason to collaborate. And data that is sensitive, right? Data yeah. that that needs to have yeah. restraints put in. Yeah, the sensitivity of the data, and and really thinking about do the existing controls your organization has in place are are they good enough? Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times, if you're within an organization, you have you have policies and you have uh, uh, existing mechanisms to safeguard the data where where we see real challenges is where you need to collaborate across an organization. Uh, and we give new tools with AWS cleanrooms that allow customers to, to safeguard their data while, while still enabling the analytics they want to achieve. I loved your demo too, Ryan, the fact that essentially it's uh, uh, highlighting the outside nature too, like when you're collaborating with, with, uh, a marketing agency, for example, um, and, and they can't share that data with, with you as the client or things like that. So that's, uh, that's you. also a really great, uh, example. Cause I think that's very real and very oftentimes, uh, where this comes up the most is when you're collaborating with somebody outside of your organization. Uh, cause that you said yep. during your demo as well too, oftentimes mm -hmm. when you're cross collaborating in the same company you, you you all adhere to the same policies already uh but even then i would say that you know it, it different might departments be, have different i was gonna say oh, you don't want yep. to share that data across different departments right it also might be worth your while too just uh zero trust uh inside me is is firing off of saying <laughs> even though it's internally right uh you, you may want these restraints to be able to track and verify right it's Mm -hmm. trust but verify always yep. so yeah. always. yep and i would say like why move the data if you don't have to right like yeah right, yeah. right. <laughs> so totally. i think any use case that is like okay i need this very specific insight does that require me to copy the entire data set to another location which is you know something that is natural comes you know um comes naturally so i think that's where we're hearing some customers ask for interdepartment you know limiting the sharing it's actually more common than I personally anticipated, uh, you know, the, within the organization. We do hear customers ask for uh, limiting the data movement and limiting data sharing. I think it just makes things easy for everybody, including, you know, meeting the regulatory compliance and, and a lot of host of other things. I still remember days pre-cloud where people would walk up between departments and say, hey, can you just put this uh, this data set on this floppy disk? Uh, yes, I'm not old. <laughs> right? and, and they take it away and do something with it. And it's like, oh, that doesn't look right. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I would say, too, if nothing else, uh, uh, the audit logs themselves are extremely valuable um, in these mm -hmm. scenarios, right? Mm -hmm. uh, knowing who and when and how people have accessed your data is uh, massively important when proving uh, after the fact, right? When, when something has happened, uh, no, we have the audit logs here. We can, we can say nothing was, was accessed inappropriately. That is, uh, yeah. you, you don't need it until you do, right? Uh, that's uh, the class. And even then you might not be able to see it. Right. <laughs> Well, it's great. a really interesting technical challenge to solve. It it's is. fascinating. I, the, the controls and the suppression. Yeah, um, yeah it's been happens. a really, really interesting journey at the intersection of analytics and, and security and privacy. Uh, so lots of lots of really interesting challenges to solve. I love it. Um, we, we had a, a question just come in from oh, chat. Yeah. Uh, which regions are currently available? Um, yeah, we're available in 11 regions uh, and we have a good mix of regions across US, uh, Europe and, and, and Asia. Um, so it's uh, the usual ones you'd expect and US East one and, and some Sydney, Singapore. There's a list of 11 regions which we can link to our What's New post that, um, that has those regions called okay. that. Perfect. Nice. Uh, any, any parting thoughts for us from Encore or Ryan, uh, you know, where, if I want to learn more about clean rooms, if I want to, uh, we, we, we got the link up for the, uh, GitHub, uh, mm -hmm. that Ryan mentioned earlier to check into more of the, uh, encryption side uh, or I'm throw that up again briefly. Yeah. Thank so, you. Sure. Uh, anything else that you, you would suggest or recommend? Yeah, I, I'd say in terms of getting started, especially if you already have data uh, on S3 uh, in a data lake, 
it's really as simple as uh, a few clicks to get started and, and start experimenting. Um, so I'd say uh, start with a use case and, and go from there. Uh, we're, we're available today for customers to start using. Nice. The only thing I would add there is that there is a fleet here, which, you know, of course, uh, we build on the compute that the query takes to run. So it's hard to say how many queries, but I think we've, uh, it should help you run between you know, 50 to 200 queries is, is our estimate. So it's enough for you to get started, start playing around with the analysis rules and, and, and think of a use case and, and just uh, be able to see it for yourself. So I would really highly recommend that. Always love a free tier option. Uh, never going to turn that down. I love it. Uh, thank you both for joining us. Mm -hmm. We're, uh, thank you. Going to take you off, but uh, wonderful, wonderful content here. Thank you both. And we hope to see you again on the show sometime. Yeah. Thanks for joining Absolutely. us. Absolutely. Thank you All so right. much.